Hello and welcome back to this introduction to designing for the web. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the foundation of good design, which is layout and composition. Design starts with your content, but one of the first things you need to do with that content is structure it in a logical way, in a way that helps the users find what they want on the page, a structure that draws their attention to the most important things. And this is done primarily, although not exclusively, through layout and composition. The cornerstone of good layout is your grid. The grid is the framework into which your content flows. It also provides the structure and order that your design needs. If you've ever read a newspaper or browsed a magazine, you've seen grids in action. They are what defines the columns and the spacing on the page. Text flows from one column into the next, and sometimes images cross multiple columns, as do headlines. But whatever the case, page elements are constrained by this underlying grid system. Between each column, there are normally gaps that separate the columns, and this prevents text from butting up against each other and sentences running together. This, these gaps are known as margins. Without them, reading content in columns will be extremely difficult. And as a general rule of thumb, the wider your, column, uh, your margins, the easier your text is going to be to read. Now, creating a grid for your design is not as hard as you think. In fact, there's no shortage of tools out there to help. These vary from free tools like gridpack.com to more sophisticated ones such as gridsetapp.com. When creating your grid, it's normally worth creating more columns than you think you actually need. And let me explain why that, why that is the case. So you look at this design and you, you think to yourself, well, actually, it's probably just a two column design. As you look at the About Us section, there are two columns. The main big image at the top obviously stretches over those, both of those columns, as does the menu bar. But as you scroll down, what you discover is that actually you've got three items across that. And that's not going to fit into a two column structure. So what you actually have now is a six column structure where your heading area goes across all six columns. Your about us area goes um, each of those sections go off over three columns each and the um, reservations, instructions and promotions. They go over two columns each. Scrolling down a little bit further, you see how that's replicated again in news and events, where each of the news and events block um, stretches over three columns each. But right at the bottom of the page, we discover that actually the grid that underlies this site is even more complicated. It's a 12 column grid system. And that's because each one of our um, four people uh, go across three columns. Then the section above here, it's going across six columns each and here it's going across four columns each. So there is a complex underlying grid system, but it is worth it. It's worth it because it gives the design a sense of cohesion. It brings everything together. It creates structure and order that will improve the user experience. It will also help you as a designer because you've got a structure within which to place things. A lot of the decisions are already made for you by your underlying grid. Now, that's not to say there aren't times when you want to break your grid, and that's absolutely fine. But do it with an underlying grid that sits below your work and you'll find the design process much easier. Unfortunately, creating a grid and indeed designing for the web isn't as simple as it is designing for print. When you're designing for print, you know the size of your canvas. You know whether you're designing for a billboard or a business card. And so you can design with those specific constraints in mind. Unfortunately, when it comes to the web, that's not the case. You see, web pages can be viewed on a huge range of devices from widescreen monitors to smartphones or even games consoles. Heck, there's even a fridge that you can view web pages on. Add to that the fact that your browser might be open full screen or it might just be in a small window. And that means you can never be sure how wide your grid needs to be. 
it needs to adapt to the available space, and this is called responsive design. With the huge growth in access uh, to the web via mobile devices, you have to have a really good reason for your site not to be built responsively these days. But building responsive websites creates some unique challenges to designers. It means your grid system needs to flex to support different screen sizes, and those columns become too narrow when you start shrinking it down so that you need to then change the number of columns you display. For example, a website on a mobile device is probably only going to be a single column, while one on a widescreen monitor may include many columns side by side. This is all difficult when graphics packages such as Photoshop or Illustrator insist that you set a canvas size before you start. And that's why many professional web designers are either designing directly in browser or they're using a new generation of tools. There's one really great example called Macor that you might want to check out to get you started. Responsive web design is a hard thing to get your head around, especially in relationship to grids. So a good rule of thumb when it comes to this is to start by designing for the smallest screen size and working up. Don't begin by designing the desktop version of your site as you're going to struggle to squash everything in when it comes to putting it on a mobile device. To help you understand exactly how responsive design works, let's take a look at a responsive website and see how it adapts as we scale it. What you're looking at here is one of the many responsive templates available on Template Monster, and it perfectly demonstrates how to um, build a responsive website and how your grid needs to adapt when you're doing so. They've got these great little toggle tools here that allow you to see what your website would look like on different devices. And what you're currently looking at here is the um, normal desktop version. But if we switch over to a tablet version, you can see how the layout has adjusted accordingly. Things have moved in um, and repositioned themselves. Let's get rid of that bar there. So um, suddenly things have shifted around. If we go down to a mobile phone version, they've shifted around still further and the website looks quite a lot different than it did previously. But you see, you can't just look at it from a device perspective. You can't just design an iPhone version of your website or an iPad version of your website. You need to think in terms of breakpoints in the content and grid structure rather than breakpoints based on a device. So let's flip over and see the same website just um, without the uh, uh, template monster tools on it. As you can see, it's a beautiful website, really nicely designed, looks great on a desktop. But as we start to scale the website down, you'll notice that um, the design adapts all the way down. It doesn't just change at particular points for a particular device like the iPhone or the iPad. Instead, it's continually adapting. It's continually changing. You notice how the navigation flipped there. Also, we've now gone to two items down here. And as we go down still further, we will see, oh, and the 50% off has jumped onto the next row down. The grid system is updating dynamically in order to suit the content. It's not being designed for a specific device. It's being designed specifically around the content that you're trying to display. A good grid system will help bring structure to your site, but it won't necessarily help the users identify what they should be focusing on. For that, you need a visual hierarchy. Your visual hierarchy is essentially the order in which you want users to view the page, what items are most important and what not so much. This is important in web design for three reasons. First, users are incredibly impatient. If they can't instantly find what it is that they want, then the chances are they'll leave. And that's why you have to make sure that the most important elements stand out from the crowd and not allow secondary content to distract them. The second reason for having a strong visual hierarchy is that we all suffer from something called choice paralysis. For example, if you're in a supermarket and you see an entire aisle of jams, then we're likely to feel overwhelmed by the choice that we have and maybe give up. But if a handful of those jams are on special offer or are put on a separate display, then we're much more likely to make a uh, purchase. 
Now the same is true for a website. If we present a user with too many options, then they're going to become overwhelmed and they're going to leave. And that means we need to create a hierarchy, effectively narrowing their choice and focusing them on the things that are most relevant to them. The final and probably most important reason to create a strong visual hierarchy is to guide the user to the options that we as a business most want to push. So for example, if you're a charity, your site may want to focus on donations. If you sell software, then it's gonna be the download button that is most important. Or if you offer a service, it might be the contact us form. A strong visual hierarchy nudges the user in the right direction. So what makes a strong visual hierarchy? Well, let's take a look. Here's a template with a nice visual hierarchy. Beyond making me incredibly hungry, it is very much telling me where I should look first. You have a very strong structure to the page. For example, it's very obvious that this is the primary area that I need to be focusing on, the shop now. But then we do have some secondary options here in terms of fish, cheese and sausage. But there's also additional products further down the page. So there is a very strong hierarchical order. Shop now first, fish, cheese and sausages second, and everything else follows that. That is what I mean by a strong visual hierarchy. So that's it for this lesson. Hopefully now you understand the need to design and build your site around a strong grid system and a strong visual hierarchy. But most of all, I hope you now see that designing for the web is not like designing for any other medium. Your site needs to be responsive to the device it is being viewed upon. And that means that we need to let go of pixel perfect control. In the next video, we're going to look at how typography can make or break your design. But until then, thanks so much for watching this video.